Well, good morning and welcome to our carol service. It is lovely to see you here this morning. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Uh, oh, excuse me, all of our carols are going to be on our carol sheet this morning, uh, so please make sure you've got sight of one of those. We've got some lovely carols to sing this morning to praise God, <clears throat> to be full of joy at this time of year, to remember that Christ has been born. We're going to have our carols, and after each carol, we're going to have a reading from the Bible to remind us of that first Christmas account. Well, we've got a wonderful carol to begin with. It's number 10, Once in Royal David's City. It's a carol that takes us from the first coming of Jesus to his second coming. It reminds us that he was born in David's city in Bethlehem, in that lowly cattle shed in a manger. But it takes us through to the point when our eyes at last shall see him, not in a poor lowly stable, but we shall see him in heaven at God's right hand on high. Let's stand as we sing together once in Royal David City. going to come and bring us our first readings. <coughs> so we're going to be in the book of Isaiah and it's <coughs> chapter 7 verse 14 and then across to chapter 9 verses 2 to 7. Right. 
Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. <coughs> He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen. Thank you, Marlis. Isaiah prophesies about one who will come to be our Prince of Peace. And in our next carol, number seven, it came upon a midnight clear. It speaks about the reality of our world today and our much need of peace. The angels declared, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in this carol, we sing about a weary world with sad and lonely parents. We speak about years of sin and strife. And the good news of Christmas is that Jesus comes as Prince of Peace to bring us peace with God through him. Let's stand as we sing together number seven, it came upon a midnight cake.
Francis is going to come and bring us our first Bible reading from the New Testament. Thank you, Francis. The reading is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Joseph accepts Jesus as his son. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Fantastic. Well, we're over in the warm corner today, slightly different than before. Samantha, if you want to come over here. Hopefully you can all still see the screen, though. Uh, Samantha, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, I wonder who you're having for Christmas, or maybe you're going to someone's for Christmas. Hopefully you're going to see your family, um, or they're going to come and see you, but perhaps you'll be remembering family that aren't here anymore, or maybe someone that you won't be able to see. Well, this morning I want us to think of someone who is with us no matter what. Someone who is here to stay with us forever. So if we can have the first slide. We've just heard this from um, Francis from the reading from Matthew. This is the angel speaking to Joseph. And the angel says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, Joseph, he was worried. He was unsure what was happening. He didn't know um, what this <coughs> dilemma meant with Mary. And he was waiting, like all of God's people, for God to come back and stay like he had promised. And here's the angel of the Lord bringing that about, speaking to Joseph in his, fear, in his fear. Well, I wonder, has anyone here ever been lost before? Have you ever been out shopping perhaps, or you've been on a trip somewhere, and you turn around and, <gasps> where's mum and dad? They're not here. And it's a horrible feeling, isn't it? You're, you're all alone and you don't know who to ask for help. You're surrounded by strangers. Maybe that's how God's people felt waiting for God. Where is God? Where are, where is God? Where is he going to come back to us? We feel so alone. Well, when the angel spoke to Joseph, um, they may have been familiar words to Joseph because actually they are the same words that a man of God spoke to God's people about 700 years before. There is Isaiah, and he's saying, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. The best news! But they had to wait, didn't they, in Isaiah's time, and now it was happening. Joseph was right in the middle of the action. But it was so much more than God with us. Well, I've got a present here. My friend has given me permission to open this before Christmas Day, so please, no shock horror. Um, because it's just a friend who I know. Um, she's a neighbour, actually, and she always gets me, yeah, she, she always gets me chocolates. Oh, hang on a minute. No, she's got me tickets to the Lion King. Wow, I thought I was just getting celebrations. That's so much more than I expected. Wow, I'm going to have to go round our 
come to church and thank her so much. Wow, that's amazing. Well, God's people were waiting for God to come and be with them, but it was going to be so much more than they expected. You see, Jesus was going to make it possible for God to be with us not just in the meantime, but forever. So whatever the circumstances we're in, we can trust the angel like Joseph did. We can trust the words that this Christmas, whatever is happening that is unknown or even sad, we know that God has come to be with us. And not just for the now, but forever. So maybe if you approach Christmas and you start panicking about Christmas dinner, or if you haven't wrapped your presents or written your cards, maybe just take a moment, remember, God is with us. What amazing news for us to be able to celebrate. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for that message from the angel to Joseph. We thank you that you did fulfill your promise and come to be with us forever. We praise you for that. We praise you for that wonderful, joyful news that we can treasure for ourselves, but also share with other people. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Samantha. We're going to stand and sing our next carol, number 11, Silent Night, Holy Night. Speaking of Jesus, who is Christ the Saviour, who is Lord. Let's stand and sing number 11. continue in Luke's Gospel and Tina's going to bring us that. Thank you. <coughs> so I'm reading the beginning of Luke chapter 2, the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, 
the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them. Thank you so much, Tina. Well, let us bow our heads as we pray together this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can meet for this carol service today to celebrate again the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that through all our carols and readings that all of the glory and honour may be yours. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you that when we were far off, that you gave your one and only Son, that by your love and grace, you offer us forgiveness and salvation through Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that Jesus humbled himself and became a man. We thank you that he humbled himself to become that baby in the manger. We thank you that today, because of Jesus, we can come into the light because of the light of the world who has come to us. <laughs> Father, as we celebrate today with our carols of praise, may our lives be changed by his life, that we may bear witness to his glory. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you are hope incarnate. In this season where some of us may be weary, with heads bowed under the pressure of life, we pray that you would grant us grace to see that our hope can be found in you this Christmas. Thank you, Father God, that you have heard our cry, that Christ has come, that hope is here. Lord Jesus, we praise you as our wonderful counsellor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace. We pray that your peace may fall upon us afresh this Christmas time. We pray for your peace to be abundant in the world. Where there is conflict, may they cease. Where there is strife and anguish, may they end. May we know you as the Prince of Peace who is with us always. Lord Jesus, you have shown us what true love is. It's unrestricted, it's lavish, it is abundant and beautiful. At Christmas time, when some may feel alone or unloved or abandoned, we pray that we, in the power of your Holy Spirit, may demonstrate your love to others at this Christmas time. So, Lord Jesus, we pray, fill us with your love. May we be channels of your love to one another and to all we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, before we hear about the shepherds in our next Bible reading, we're going to sing of them in the carol, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks by Night. It's number 15 in your carol sheets and takes us to that hillside outside Bethlehem where the good news is proclaimed to them. Let's stand as we sing, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks by Night.
please do take a seat. And Theo's going to come and bring us our next reading. Thank you. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of God shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, the word spread around concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who had heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thank you so much, Theo. Well, we're going to watch a spoken word DVD now, so I hope you can see the screen over there. It's called uh, The Christmas Chord, and it shows us that the whole of the Christmas story is tied together by one chord, a theme running through it. And it'll help us to see that Christmas story coming together in Jesus, who is our Lord. Let me tell you about my favourite story. It's all right, don't worry, it's uh, not gory. It's the first Christmas story, and not to be clever, but it's about this one chord which ties everything together. Not a call to the fairy light on the Christmas tree. This story starts at night, so uh, picture the scene. Three blocks on the hill, tended to the flock, run of the mill stuff, you know, till they get quite a shock. You see, this angel turns up and shines in glory. It's true, it's a true story. Whoa! says the angel, it's all right, no danger, just start letting you know of this baby in a manger. Do you good to go visit if you're able? This one's special. You'll find him in a stable. A king, if you can, go see him. Then, a moment they'll treasure throughout the days when a whole host of angels set up their praise and in accord, the guys agreed. Yeah, yeah, count us in. Count us in, indeed. Cut new scene, more blocks, not shepherds, but intellectual sorts of guys with telescopes out studying the skies. They spot this particular star in the night. And so the guys follow the star in the sky in the night. Months later, they arrive to see the birth of the son of the Most High, born as royalty king, destined to be more than a baron or a servant. So they brought him three gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. So humbled to witness this significant scene, the wise men they knelt onto a knee, so tender, so mild, they all thought it. Born in Bethlehem, called him the prophet. Now, flip back to the beginning, we meet a guy called Joe, engaged, doomed to tie the knot with his Mary girl, but now he's not so sure. She's pregnant, not his. Why did she come clean? But then this angel turns up in his dream. Don't panic, says the angel. Things are what they seem. The big guy wants you on the parenting team. You see, God's only son is living inside Mary. He's going to be born and he's going to save many. What the angel said, it struck a chord. It went in and Joe strived to obey God from there on in. Now skip past the guys with their flock, you know, the ones in shock. Skip past the guys searching the skies and we're back in the stable. They cut his umbilical cord, nature's cable, all in all. A cord of worship to little guy in the cradle. And this 
yet the guy so vulnerable and so weak, but destined to be king and they shall bow at his feet. You see, we sing carols with instrumental chords, but guess what? It's got nothing to do with jolly old claws. We sing to celebrate only one thing, this one moment in history which changed everything. And when we remember this little guy, we remember he is son of the Most High in a crib with straw in his face, yet God's trump calm against the sin of a broken race. This is a story all about a cold, about a little guy who was king, and our sin he brought. You see the cord which makes Christmas is G Sus. Lord. Last verse there was from Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is Lord. Well, we're going to sing another carol. It's time for a Cornish carol. Uh, number 22, the first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. Uh, the first carol sung by the angels at the first Christmas, followed by the wise men, followed by us today as we continue to sing his praises. As we stand to sing number 22, the first Noel, uh, Samantha's going to go upstairs uh, with the young people, and so you, you head out during this carol, and we'll see you later on. But let's stand and sing the first Noel. <laughs>
please do take a seat. Have to catch your breath as well. Great carol to sing, lots of verses, great joy. Uh, Trees is going to come and bring us our next reading now from Matthew chapter 6. <coughs> Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 to 12. The visit of the manager. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Major from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Well, thank you so much, Trues. Uh, please keep a mark on that passage. We're going to turn back to it in just a moment, and we're going to consider uh, that uh, little passage this morning. Well, before we do that, we're going to sing of the wise men that we've just heard of. It's number three. As with gladness, men of old did the guiding star behold. And the end of the first verse is a, a thoughtful prayer before we look at God's word. So most gracious God, may we evermore be led to thee. Let's stand and sing number three, as with gladness, men of old.
And if you have a Bible, please turn back with me to uh, that passage Truth has just read to us. <laughs> and while you're turning there, great opportunity to just say thank you to our music group. It's lovely for us, isn't it, to sing carols together. Uh, thank you so much for playing so helpfully for us this morning. <coughs> well, this time next week, our new king, Charles, will address the nation in his first king's speech. I wonder what he's going to say. Well, I'm pretty sure he's not going to comment on what's been on the telly recently. I think he might skip that one. Mm -hmm. He'll certainly look back, won't he, to the reign of his mum, 70 years, and, and give thanks for all that has come before. I'm sure he'll think about the nation's response to her passing as well. But this time next week on Christmas Day, it's going to be very different. Because for as long as most of us can remember, at 3 p.m. on Christmas Day, it's been the Queen's speech. It's been an important part of the day. I, I always ask the question, CG, when can we open the presents? Well, after the Queen's speech. Uh, when can I phone up friends and family? Well, not till after the Queen. Uh, when can we go out for a walk? Not till after the Queen. The, the Queen kind of sets the, the middle of the day going, doesn't it? And last year, if you remember, she addressed the nation and spoke of the loss of her dear husband, Prince Philip. She reflected on a truth that sadly most of us are all too familiar with, the empty place at the family celebrations. Last year, the Queen said this, although it is a time of great happiness and good cheer for many, Christmas can be hard for those who've lost loved ones. And that's true, and we know it to be true this year as in previous years. And that personal reflection has carried on a tradition of a, a king or queen's speech on Christmas Day. The very first one was given 90 years ago. In 1932, uh, King George V from Sandringham said these words, I speak now from my home and from my heart to you all. Christmas Day is a very personal message from the sovereign to their people. Seven years after King George had said those words, his son, George VI, had to do a speech in 1939 uh, just after the outbreak of uh, World War II. He ended his uh, speech with words of encouragement from a, a familiar poem, God Knows, by Minnie Haskins. You, you know the one. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. Uh, quite a remarkable speech uh, from a man who, if you've, if you've seen the film, uh, The King's Speech, you know, the one with Colin Firth, you know that he had uh, a speech impediment, making any kind of speech, especially a Christmas Day broadcast, really difficult for him. But this Christmas Day is going to be different. We've got a new king, Charles III. What's he going to say? Well, it'll be in his own style, no doubt, but it'll be a personal message from the sovereign to his people. In our reading in Matthew chapter 2, we've got another new king, but not one who's speaking himself. One who is being spoken about and spoken about as a personal king. The message is clear from the actions and the words of other people. Jesus is a newborn king. He is a shepherd king, and he is a king who is to be worshipped. Just look with me at each of those aspects of King Jesus in Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, begins with these words. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Matthew's reminding us, in case we've forgotten, that Christmas is all about Jesus, the newborn king. It's so easy, isn't it, to get swamped with all the busyness of rushing around. You know, you've only got a, you've only got a week now to get that present that you've forgotten about, uh, and you need to get on and do it. Uh, there's all of the wrapping of the presents. Hopefully the writing of the cards has been done. There's the preparing to travel, or the preparing to receive visitors. There's the listening to carols, there's the singing of the corny Christmas tunes. But in all of that busyness and noise, Matthew wants to remind us that Christmas is about Jesus, the newborn king. He makes it really clear, doesn't he, in the readings that we've had. 
who is the central character. Because, of course, we've got Joseph and Mary, and we've got Herod and the wise men, but three times here in Matthew chapter 2, he tells us about Jesus, who is born. Just look at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Then in verse 2, the question of the wise men, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? And again in verse 4, when Herod doesn't know the answer to the question, he calls together the people's chief priests and teachers of the law and asks them whether Christ was to be born. So three times in just a few verses, it's all about the newborn king. Jesus has been born. Now, in our earlier reading from Matthew, we heard Matthew referring to Jesus in three different ways. He refers to the baby as Jesus in Matthew 1.21. Uh, we saw that on the DVD, didn't we? We heard it from Samantha. Jesus is called that because he will save his people from their sins. Here in chapter 2, he's called king in contrast to Herod. And he's also called the Christ or the Messiah, the anointed one. Now, when you hear that term, Christ or Messiah, perhaps you automatically think of Handel's great music about the Messiah in those three wonderful parts that describe his birth and then his death, resurrection and ascension and then looking forward to his return. The point Matthew's making is really clear. Christmas is all about Jesus, the newborn king. So listen to the question the wise men ask in verse 2. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? What an interesting question to ask. Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? Not the one who will one day be king. Not the, the one who one day will ascend to the throne and have his great big coronation and, and finally be crowned king. No, the one who's already been born king. Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? And it's an interesting question that Matthew puts at the beginning of his Gospel, and it's familiar to the readers of Matthew because it appears again at the end of his Gospel. Because as the one who's been born King of the Jews ends his life on a cross, he's crucified with a sign written above him, Jesus, the King of the Jews. Jesus is born as King. Not a constitutional figurehead, but a true leader and ruler and sovereign. One who sets a perfect example in life and in love and in action. One who does speak and have his own speech and it's words that are full of grace and truth. One who's consistent in his life, both in public and in private. One who's perfect, holy and righteous. One who I have found to be a joy to follow. And we're told here in Matthew that the newborn king is born in Bethlehem, into a place of poverty, into a place of pain. Earlier this year, Philly and I were privileged to be able to go to Bethlehem uh, back in May. And, and sadly, it's still a place uh, of great poverty. There's rubbish strewn everywhere. It's a place where people are struggling to, to make ends meet and make sense of life. And the Bethlehem of today was the Bethlehem of old. And into this mess comes Jesus. Not born in a royal palace, but humbling himself to become a man, to be a baby born and placed in a manger. Matthew wants us to get the point straight off. Christmas is about Jesus, the newborn king. Amidst all your busyness over the next week or so, don't miss the humility of Jesus who comes into this world for you. Don't miss the majesty of Jesus who is king. Well, some people who get that are the wise men, and we'll see them in a moment. But Matthew wants us to see, first of all, that Jesus is not only a newborn king, but he's also a shepherd king. We saw earlier in that DVD, the Christmas chord, there is a, a chord, a thread, running through the Christmas story, bringing it all together. And the same is true of the whole Bible story. There are chords and threads running through that point us clearly to Jesus. And Matthew picks up on Micah's prophecy in the Old Testament. If you have a Bible there, you'll see it. He quotes in verse 6. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. 
At the end of that quote from Micah, Matthew summarizes, and he summarizes uh, Micah chapter 5 and verse 4, that says he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Matthew's point is, Jesus has been born to be not only a king, but a shepherd king, a particular kind of king. One who's come to call us, one who's come to care for us, one who's come to die for us. Now this Advent, we as a church have been reading through a book together, a daily readings that have been reminding us of the humility of Jesus in coming into this world. Uh, one true gift. I hope you've been enjoying reading those as we have. But, but alongside that, I also hope you've had your, your Advent candle burning away, counting down the days. On Thursday, we lit it at youth group, and uh, I almost sort of got right through to Christmas that evening until one of them pointed out that candle's still going. I think we're a few days ahead now. Uh, and also alongside your, your reading and your Advent candle, I really hope you've got your chocolate calendar as well, because you kind of need all three to go together, don't you? But I remember one year where our Advent calendar was... Uh, words on a piece of string and you, you turn them around each day and they were names of Jesus really lovely but didn't have any chocolate there so don't worry we supplemented other ways but but on one day we turned around and it was good shepherd picking up the words of Jesus and on the calendar it said this that there are lots of sheep in the bible and lots of shepherds too there's Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who are told to look after sheep there's King David who was a boy had to fend off hungry wolves and bears who are the first people that the angels tell that jesus is born well it's shepherds watching their flocks by night and then jesus comes into the world and as he speaks as he proclaims that he is a personal king he says i am the good shepherd and the good shepherd has come to lay down his life for his sheep See, back in the Old Testament, God referred to uh, the leaders of his people in Ezekiel 34 as shepherds of his people, but they were bad shepherds. Bad shepherds to the point where God says, I'm going to come myself and shepherd my people. And in Jesus, God comes to care for us and love us, to lead us and to guide us. But the main role Jesus says that he's willing to do as the shepherd is to lay down his life for his sheep. Jesus is a newborn king, but he's a special kind of king. He's a shepherd king. He's one who's not come to lord it over us, but to serve us, because he loves us. What a message of great joy this Christmas. Here is a king who wants to speak to you, and his message to you is, I love you and want to serve you so much that I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus is the one who demonstrates what love is as he goes to that cross and dies for you and for me. Jesus is a newborn king, he's a shepherd king, and so he's a worshipped king. We come to the wise men in Matthew chapter 2 and we read of them in verse 11 that on coming to the house they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshipped. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. These wise men or magi are, are a curious bunch, aren't they? What are we to make of them? Well, in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, we come across magi. Uh, they're in the Babylonian Empire. They're people who are able to interpret dreams. They're interested in astrology and magic and the future. And we're told here in Matthew that these magi... They saw a star, and in verse 2 we're told, it's his star. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. How did they know it was his star? It's quite a thing, isn't it? It's wonderful to see on these clear nights. It might have been bitterly cold, but there have been beautiful clear nights recently. You've been able to see ever more clearly the stars in the sky, and perhaps you've spotted some of the planets more clearly. Uh, recently, Mars has been really clearly visible. Uh, just low in the sky, it's been often near to the moon, and it's very visible because it's orangey-red colour. But, but you spot it and you go, you know, without much knowledge, you go, I know that's Mars. These wise men see a, a new star, a different star, they call it his star, and it so moves them that they get up and move. 
and take their long journey off to Jerusalem. These wise men are men of faith. They see that star, they follow it, they ask about the newborn king, and when they see him, we're told here in verse 11, they bow down and worship him. Now he's only a baby, possibly a little child, but he's under two. And they bow down and worship him as king. They're men of faith. But they're also men of hope. They're, they're trusting that God is keeping his promises, and they're trusting in this baby, so much so that we're told they are overjoyed to see him. Now, there's always joy in seeing a new baby, isn't there? Uh, and, and maybe cuddling a new baby. But they're overjoyed to see the baby and bow down and offer gifts to this baby. They're men of hope that God will do what he said he will do. And they're men of love because they give these expensive gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. These men worship Jesus. They bow down in adoration. They're not out of their minds because we call them wise men. They're not nice but dim. No, they're wise and they worship King Jesus. They're the kind of people who look at the stars and wonder. They're the kind of people who look at the world around and say, what am I doing here? Where have I come from? Where are we going? What's it all about? They're the kind of people who seek and who search and who long for answers about life. And these wine mice men find the answers in Jesus. They see the significance of this newborn shepherd king, and they accept him as king, and so bow down and worship him. Matthew wants to draw a contrast between these wise men who do that and, and King Herod. King Herod is... Well, he's more than the pantomime villain that we're to boo at when he comes on stage. Now, our history books tell us that Herod the Great was appointed king of Judah by the Romans. We're told that he was wealthy, that he was politically gifted. He was an excellent administrator. His famine relief was apparently superb. His large building projects, including the temple in Jerusalem, were splendid and admired. But King Herod loved power. He suffered an illness that compounded his own paranoia. And so he ended up being deeply troubled. No wonder when we read, when the wise men turn up in Matthew 2 and chapter 3, that when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Sadly, his paranoia led him to murder two of his own sons and his favourite wife. I mean, favourite wife's an interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, although I can see how that can lead me into deep trouble. Uh, so, <laughs> Herod the mass murderer, though, doesn't really speak of Christmas, doesn't sound very Christmassy, does it? Actually, for all of his power and all of his influence and all of the good he was able to do and knew, he doesn't know the answer to the question in verse 2. Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? He hasn't got a clue. I wonder how Herod felt at that point, probably embarrassed. He summons all his wise men and his chief priests, and he, and he wants to know the answer. And he demands of them the answer, then they tell him in Bethlehem in Judea. And then we see under false pretenses, he says, come back to me and tell me later, because I too want to go and worship. Well, we sense it's false, fake news because of what he does later on. Herod's in contrast to the wise men. He's not got an open and curious mind that wonders about the world outside of his kingdom. No, he's got a closed heart that says no to God and rejects Jesus as king. Can I urge you this Christmas, don't be a pale reflection of the weak King Herod who rejects Jesus without thinking about it. But like the wise men, come and worship Jesus this newborn shepherd king who's come to give his life for you. So in a week's time, I hope you're settling down with a, a nice full tummy of turkey and, and three o'clock rolls around and our new king speaks and we'll hear what he says. But as he speaks, would you join with me in giving thanks to God for the newborn shepherd king, Jesus? Would you join with me and worship him and him alone as your Lord and King. Well, we're going to sing a song of praise of that King Jesus. 
with our last carol, which is number one in your carol sheets. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And that refrain is repeated at the end of each of the verses. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Let's stand as we sing number one together. tea and for coffee that'll be served just at the side of the room in a moment and also if you'd like to come back on Christmas Day we shall be here at half past ten on Christmas morning for a, about a 45 minute service uh, please do join us for, for that as well. I'm going to close as we pray together. Dear Heavenly Father we thank you for Jesus the newborn King. We give you glory that you sent your one and only Son into this world to be our Saviour <coughs> and Lord. Help us please this Christmas in all the busyness, in all of the thoughts that run through our minds. Help us please to come and worship Jesus, our King. For we ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.